yeah, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Zach Miller today. Um, Zach uh, is coming from the Institute for Genomic Diversity, um, also known as the, the Buckler Lab. Um, uh, Zach is a senior developer, uh, senior software developer at that lab. He's, he's been there about nine years now, um, uh, based uh, here out of, out of Cornell University. Um, and Zach is going to talk to us about uh, one of the big projects coming out of there um, called the, the PHG or the Practical Haplotype Graph. So I will turn it over to you, Zach. All right. Uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, we will share. And slideshow. Okay. So um, as uh, Peter mentioned, uh, one of the big uh, programming efforts from our lab is this practical app graph. Um, so uh, here I'm going to be giving a little bit of an overview of, uh, of what it is, how it works, and kind of some of the updates we've done between the versions. Um, and also, just so I know, uh, I have a bunch of the other uh, programmers uh, in the chat. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in there and uh, somebody will answer them as I'm talking. So, um, so just a basic introduction, overview, background, motivation type thing. Um, so as we've gone on, sequencing costs have come down a lot, right? Um, but it's still somewhat cost prohibitive to basically sequence your entire breeding population at high depths um, for a lot of these plant studies. So um, while this is happening, also um, reference quality assemblies have actually become much more uh, ubiquitous. There's a lot of them out there. They're making more every day. Um, and they're becoming very widely available um, for a number of staple food crops. Uh, and so the PhD was kind of created to um, ask this question, can we actually use uh, the diversity captured by a collection of the assemblies at very high depth, um, which we refer to as a pangenome, um, to impute the low-cost short-read genotyping data uh, a little bit better than your traditional uh, align your short reads against a single reference and then call SNPs. So with that, the PhD was born. Uh, we started development on it in 2017. Um, we had some initial success uh, making these things for a variety of different crops. So um, this paper was actually the, the overall um, definition of the, the toolkit, but we've uh, applied these in sorghum, uh, cassava, and also wheat. Um, and there's been a couple other efforts to try to get this working um, for various different use cases like imputation, genomic selection, um, and also just storing your data in a format that could be usable down the line. Um, but the big problem was we, as, as people tried this and um, they got in the weeds a little bit trying to get it to work, we, we realized there was a couple pretty key um, issues that we would like to fix. So. Uh, one of them was we we used a custom database schema that uh, to store the SNPs and also the sequences, uh, and it just was pretty bulky. And when we had to change things, it would mess up everybody's version. So it, it was just kind of a mess. Um, also, certain components, so certain like uh, routines you would need to run certain pipelines would be uh, somewhat slow. Uh, it was overly parameterized, so we we tried to give. Uh, the users a lot of flexibility um, to make this very applicable to a lot of different uh, use cases, but it ended up uh, confusing people um, because we gave them too much rope, basically. Um, and as a part of that, the user interface was actually really hard to use. And also, it was continually being updated, but we weren't keeping up to date with the documentation. So um, basically, back in September 2023, we said, OK, can we just rebuild the whole thing from scratch? Um, and try to address these issues. So um, these are kind of the main key points that we've really tried to focus on as we redesign this software um, so that it's fast, it's easy to use, um, the documentation is clear, concise, up to date. Um, we've also started to really um, heavily integrate some standard software development practices. So we use things like continuous integration to unit test our code automatically and often. Um, and also continuous delivery. So we don't have to really worry about packaging up our code once it's ready to be used by people. We just merge it into our code base and it automatically uh, makes a package available for the community to use, um, which makes it really helpful if somebody has an issue and they need it debugged, we can fix it in a day and they have a working version within minutes, basically. Um, also, as we've been, again, because we started in 2017, 
new tools have come out that have kind of uh, become community standards or they're very state of the art. So in particular, AnchorWave, um, we use, it was actually created in our lab initially, but it uses uh, a wavefront alignment approach, um, which does really well at aligning assemblies against each other. Um, we use TalDB for genotype, um, typically stored in a VCF-like uh, file to store it. Um, and then we also found this uh, compressor that uh, will store uh, FASTA sequence in a very compact and easily, um, easily and efficiently queryable um, data structure called Assembled Genomes Compressor. So we try to leverage all three of these tools and others um, to make this as useful as possible. Um, so that begs the question, what do we mean by a practical haplotype graph? So um, I'll kind of go through the terms just so it's, it's clear. So practical, from day one, we basically said, okay, keep it as simple as possible. Um, we realized that biology produces genomes with somewhat consistent patterns. Um, you have somewhat conserved genes, and then you have an energetic space that has a lot of variation. Um, but with these conserved genes, we can use those boundaries of the genes to basically slice the genome up into um, anchor points or um, what we call reference ranges. Um, and this really heavily simplifies the pan-genome representation. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, also, what do we mean by haplotypes? So we're, we're kind of defining haplotypes as a set of DNA variations or polymorphisms that tend to be inherited together. Um, and as part of the system, we're actually storing both the sequence and the variance. So you can use either type of data to do downstream analysis. Um, and then a graph, um, which I will show right now. So what is a graph? So at its basic uh, definition, it's a collection of vertices. Um, that represent data, and then a bunch of edges that connect those data points together. Um, and for the PhD, we actually further simplify this to use what's called the trellis graph. So we have this very columnar uh, organization where we have reference ranges. So these are genes and then energetic space. Um, and we basically slice up each individual's genome to fall within these, these nice ranges. And then um, we allow, when we're actually computing on this and trying to figure out um, paths through this graph, we allow um, nodes to basically go to any of the next um, collection of nodes for the next reference range. Um, and I'll get to that when we talk a little bit more about the imputation. But um, so this is basically this, the thing. You, you notice there aren't any loops. Um, you can't go back on to um, previous nodes. Um, it's, it's a very linear. Um, style of graph representation. And what this ends up looking like um, typically when you actually apply it to sequence. So um, we have a reference, we might have three or four assemblies. Um, you can store up to 80 or so of these in there without having any sort of issue. Um, but we split these regions um, by some pre pre known uh, basically set of coordinates. Um, and we, we extract out the sequence for that. So this reference has GAT, CG, ATT, GAG, CTA, GA, and so on. Um, and this extends out um, until you fill up a chromosome. Um, and then basically we have some variation here. So for instance, assembly A and C have uh, some missing base pairs here um, when we align it. Um, and then this one actually has an insertion um, right about here. So. We represent it this way, um, and I'll kind of walk through this and show you how we can build this. So um, this is basically the somewhat high level, somewhat simplified uh, workflow that we have to do um, to basically create the database. So that's the first step. And then we can use it to impute WGS short reads. Um, and so we'll start here uh, at the create ranges. So basically, we, we need some definition of what some good cut points are. Um, so the, the software is designed to take any file that's in a bed format. Um, so you could you could do something totally different than this if you have a very um, you have a very good handle on where you want your cut sites to be. You could just pass in you could skip this step and pass in the bed file later on and it'll work fine. Um, but basically the idea is you um, we have this nice little tool called Create Ranges, um, which will take a GFF file. Um, it'll also take the reference FASTA that corresponds to it, um, and Basically, in this case, by default, it will basically extract out the genes and then convert it into a, a bed file, and then it will fill in the gaps between the genes as well. So there's no gene between 5 and 12, so we have to add one between 5 and 11 in bed 
uh, coordinates. Um, also, just to note, I'm I'm going to put the um, the the actual command you would run to execute this, just to kind of show how easy it is to execute these commands without um, a ton of parameters. Um, so that's now we have our our bed file. So now we look into loading. So say we have a reference and our three assemblies. These would be the sequences before they've been sliced up. Um, you basically load all those FASTA file names into this list of FASTAs, and you run this AGC compressed file, and it makes an AGC record um, that has all these compressed and uh, ready to be used later on. Uh, the next step would be our alignment step. So here's where AnchorWave comes in. Um, sorry, one step before that. So the first thing is we need to cut up our reference. So uh, we we have our reference sequence, and then we we apply that G, or that bed file. And then we'll slice it up into these little subsequences. Um, and this can be done by running this command. Uh, the output of this, though, is uh, a file that we call uh, HVCF. So it's actually a VCF file that um, we are able to store haplotype type information inside it. And the key to that is basically we use the sequence itself to become an ID. And then that becomes a symbolic allele in a normal VCF file. So. This will work with a lot of existing VCF tools without any sort of uh, changes to the file or the code itself. It just kind of works. So um, what that actually looks like is we, we hash each one of these independently, and we'll, we'll get our list of IDs. And then um, basically, we'll store the sample name and then the regions. The regions are important because those um, you can then use plus the reference name to extract out the input sequence from the AGC record um, without much trouble. Uh, and then also the, it's it's self-validating. You could then rehash that sequence you extracted against your hat and, and check it against your hash. And if those don't match, something's screwed up along the pipeline. Um, so there is some benefits to this. So instead of storing millions of variants, we actually only need to store one for each reference range. So this would be your, your genes and your energetic space. Um, again, it's VCF based, so it's it's a very well-known community standard. It's somewhat easy to understand. Um, and there's a lot of tools out there that work with this. Um, we also know that now that you can index this, so it actually works well with small and large indices. So you can index it for very fast query speeds. Um, even for big genomes like wheat um, that typically have trouble with these very big uh, chromosomes. And again, you can reconstitute the sequence based on the haplotype metadata. You can verify it. And the big thing that we're looking for is that we can load it into this TileDB system. Um, so yeah, then once you have that initial HVCF, then we start to uh, add more assemblies to our, our graph. So the first step there is we, we align it. So we use this anchor wave tool. Um, and basically, it outputs a uh, an MAF file, which is a multiple alignment file. I believe that's what the, the term is. But um, basically, it'll, it'll take chunks in an anchored approach and try to do a global alignment between them. Um, and so it, it's really good at aligning, especially plant genomes, together. Um, and it, it doesn't need to have chromosome versus chromosome. It'll, it can take contigs and map it against the reference chromosomes without much trouble. Um, and so this basically just makes that file. And then we now we have an alignment. So we can actually start cutting these at those reference range points that we had before. And we make a new set of haplotypes. And this actually would spit out an HVCF as well. So um, yeah, so you, basically you do that, and then we would load everything in. So you, you've done this for all your assemblies now, and those go directly into TileDB. A very simple command um, to do so. And what this ends up looking like, we can represent this in in the RAM of the computer as we're, we're um, working on it um, like this. Uh, we actually don't specifically draw these edges. They're kind of just held in memory, and they're, they're computed on the fly. Um, but we direct edges that connect each haplotype with all haplotypes in the next reference range. And we store, we, we do weight these so that there's a stronger weight in consecutive uh, haplotypes for a given sample. So we, we do allow it to, to cross over, but for the most part, it should be, unless there's no extra evidence to jump, it should stay along the same uh, path. So that begs the question, what can we do with it now that we have PhD?
So kind of the, the main use case is imputation um, that we've done. So say you have a set of short reads. Um, these are really short reads. You, these will usually be about 150 base pair. Um, but just for illustrative purposes, I'll do short stuff. Um, so given a, a FASTA file of a bunch of reads and given a graph, can we find a path through this graph that will um, allow us to impute missing data? So um, in this case, this would be the, the optimal path that would be chosen. So uh, I will go into how this is done, just so we understand it. So um, basically, we can have like thousands of samples of these at very low depths. So um, the beauty of the PhD is we can actually use any sort of technology um, as input to this. We, we're not very picky on making sure you're only using GBS or DartSeq. Um, pretty much as long as it's in a FASTQ file, we'll load it in. Um, and this takes place over a two-step process um, for each sample. And our goal is, it's a pretty big goal, but we would like this to be able to be done in a couple of minutes. Um, a lot of alignment takes a lot of time. And if we can get it down to doing minutes, you can do this for a lot of things very quickly and it can be very useful. So um, traditionally, we've, we've actually integrated um, traditional tools like Minimap2 um, to do the alignment, but we uh, found that it, it took a fair bit of time to do so and you would need somewhat um, large computing resources to make it work right. Um, and part of this problem is when we align against the pan genome, I'll go back, we're aligning against all of these sequences all at the same time. Um, so it does add um, both compute time and uh, resource requirement. So we, we took a step back and we thought, hey, can we actually make something that is faster and doesn't really require this oh, a huge amount of resources? And so we came up with this camera based approach. So. Um, the way this works is you have to build a camera index first. So um, how this goes is basically we walk through each reference range by reference range. Okay, We take out the haplotype sequences for each reference range. Um, in this case, I color coded it red and blue because the red and the blue haplotypes each are um, matching each other. So um, basically, you only have to do this once. Uh, and what we do is we end up taking um, some sort of KMER. Um, we had the software um, looks for 31 MERS, um, and it will do a sliding window across the entire sequence. And it will take both the forward strand and the reverse complement of that sequence. So in this illustration, we do three MERS. So the first one would be GAT. It would take this chunk here, and then it would flip it to ATC. And then it would go ATC, flip it to GAT, and then TCG, flip it to CGA. And we do that for both sets of haplotypes. Um, again, these are the haplotype IDs, which are basically just the hash of the sequence. Um, then what we do for each pair, um, we keep what's called the lowest hash. So in this case, I'm just taking the lowest alphabetically. Um, and this is just so we keep the size of our index down. Um, because when we check our reads, we actually flip it both ways as well. Um, and check the camers on both sides. So we, we remove uh, the, the higher of the two. And then what we will also do is remove any duplicates. So in this case, this GAT and this ATC actually had the same hash of ATC. So we only keep one record because we don't need to have multiple ones pointing to this haplotype. Um, so then you proceed on and you, you basically compute this for the entire uh, graph. And then we also, just to kind of clean up our alignment, um, we, we apply a filter that removes any uh, KMERS that, that are shared across reference ranges. So in particular, CTC found in these blue haplotypes here was also found in this green haplotype. So um, what we'll do is we'll remove it because it'll make alignment a little bit easier downstream. And so this is what we're left with with our, our index. Uh, and so what this allows us to do, this is actually pretty small. We, we turn this into a binary file um, and it's, it's very compressed. Um, but what we can then do is align against it very fast. So um, in computer science, basically, th this ends up going into a hash map and looking into a hash map is very fast. So um, basically to do this, we then take our reads from before. We take our index. So we, we apply the reads to our index and we basically circle whatever ones get hit. Um, and then we count 
if there was a read supporting that specific half ID set. So in particular, this one right here, the CTA read was actually shared against these two haplotypes in this reference range. So we, we actually do keep track of the whole set, not just the unique ones. And so realistically, we can say there was two reads that hit 361174 and one read that hit 9FB476. Um, and so there, intuitively, this means that we should be selecting on this, this brown haplotype over the yellow one um, because we've had more reads that hit that. Um, just kind of a side note here, um, I mentioned it was very performant. So um, we did actually test this with a Maze PHG um, built with 80 assemblies um, with Paradigm 150 base pair WGS at about 5x depth. Um, and I, I think the results speak for themselves. So the, the indexing of the graph, that's a, that's a one-time job that did take a little bit more time. The RAM usage was still down. But when we applied it to this specific WGS reads, and this is the part that you'll be doing thousands of times, um, it was it was running in less than a minute um, on very low resources. Like this would run on a laptop without much issue. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, yep. And so now once we have that read mapping, can we use it to actually figure out what the the likely path was through the graph? So. We have our, our read mapping set over here. We have our graph back. And basically, we circle. Again, we, we kind of attribute the counts to which haplotypes get hit. And a thicker line box means we have more reads hit it. Um, so in particular, um, we're not sure which of the two this is, or even here, um, which one it can pick. But we know for sure that this one hit really well. These ones hit a little bit worse. Um, and this was all the same because it's a shared haplotype. And so then we apply a hidden Markov model. Um, this is actually the same as PHG version one. Um, we haven't changed this code at all, um, but it will, based on those read mappings, it will try to figure out what the most likely path is through this graph. So and this is what we're left with. So um, once you have that, it'll actually spit out a new HVCF file of this path. Um, and then you can use that to basically go back and say, okay, what SNPs are a part of this path? And because we stored the GVCFs coming from or they're, they're in another tile DB, um, you can actually get that information out as well. So um, again, find baths command outputs of HVCF. Uh, it allows you to associate SNPs and it can actually do both haploid and diploid pathfinding, um, which is nice. And then there's also this likely paths option that can be turned on, um, which will basically, it will filter out um, any assemblies that just didn't have a lot of read support. Um, and that helps the HMM figure out uh, it, it, it helps smooth kind of the, the hidden Markov model process and it, it makes a much better, more accurate uh, set of calls that way. Um, and so now how can you use it? And Peter's gonna like this. Uh, basically we have uh, the PHG v2 comes bundled with a simple KTOR server. So all you have to do is just say PHG start server. Uh, there are a couple hidden parameters there you can tweak to say like if you need to change the port or something, um, but at a basic, you just do this, and it spins up a Brappy compliant web server um, that will utilize the variant uh, set and all the variants, the call sets, all that stuff to um, allow you to access um, this genotype and this haplotype information through Brappy. Um, we also have a companion R uh, class called RPHG um, that Brandon in the chat developed. Um, this allows you to basically interact a lot smoother, and it, it puts things directly into data frames, and then um, you can then pass that on to different R analysis toolkits, uh, such as RTASL or um, other generalized ones, um, and do different types of analysis. So again, what kind of analysis you can do? So these are just kind of some ideas that we, um, we've we either done or we've kind of thought you could do. So genomic selection, uh, GWAS studies as well. Um, you can use both the imputed variants and the or the imputed haplotypes. You can pick what you want. Um, you could link and visualize haplotype information with the metadata from it. Um, we can make kinship and distance matrices. You can subset regions of the path, and you could ask the question, okay, this gene is interesting. What does the rest of the pan genome look like around it? Um, and basically, the, the idea is that anything you can do with VCF, you could probably do with an HVCF, so you should try it. Um, at least it'll, it'll work with the tool. We're not sure if the science is correct or not, but you could try it and see.
Um, so that's basically an overview of where the, the project stands right now. Um, these are kind of what we're working on currently and going into the summer. Um, one of the big requests from some of our initial users was that um, at each step of this pipeline, they'd like to see uh, different quality control metrics and figures um, so that they can very easily debug the pipeline. And so we're, we're kind of working through um, implementing these in so they just they get run automatically as you run each step. Um, and then it's kind of up to the user if they want to actually look at the report or not. Um, but at least it's there, it's it's viewable, so they can see what worked and what didn't. Um, there's also a rare allele pipeline that we're currently working through. Um, this is basically allowing you to use some of these imputed paths to potentially find rare alleles within uh, new samples. And we might be able to use this to actually add additional diversity to our graph structure as well. Um, so if you don't have a lot of assemblies and you need to add more diversity that you have in WGS or some other form, um, there might be ways to get that in so that it's available when you do future uh, analysis. Uh, one of the other things that, um, because AI is all the rage and transformers are cool, um, we're starting to kind of think through, can we replace the imputation with the hidden Markov model with um, an artificial intelligence model? Um, again, this is very, very early on, but we'll, we're will we going to try it and see if it works or not. Um, and then part of it too is uh, we really want this to be used by people out there. Um, so. Um, right now, we know of at least five species where PhD version twos are being built currently right now, um, maize, sorghum, cassava, wheat, cotton, um, and there's more on the way. Um, and a lot of this with these early alpha tests, beta tests, um, we, we really like to know, okay, what are the stress points? What's confusing in the documentation? What's confusing in the pipeline? Is this parameter worded intuitively? All that kind of stuff. So um, as part of that, we have a GitHub. Um, and again, I, I really do think we have a lot of really good documentation. Um, but the big thing is we, we do welcome code contributions. And if there's any sort of issues, um, we do have the GitHub issues page set up and the discussions. Um, and then we also have a PHG file stars tag, um, which we've, we've had users use, um, before, and we're pretty active in making sure that those questions are answered. And, um, if there's any bugs or anything, um, to update them. Um, and the other thing too is because we've we've integrated continuous delivery. Um, basically, whenever we make a change, it's available to the public. They can use it right then, um, and it's it's really helpful because say we need to fix something, it's just available. They don't have to go through a really convoluted workaround to test something out. Um, they can just download the the. Um, Um, these are all the programmers in the Buckler Lab, plus myself. Um, again, we've been working on version two of this pipeline since September, and I think it's come a long way in that really short amount of time. Um, and it's pretty, pretty workable too. So um, we also have some biology quality control people and alpha testers, um, Bethany Sinta in our lab, and then Chison at, um, at uh, BioHPC at Cornell. Um, he, he's developing uh, the initial sorghum PHGV2. Um, and then just our leadership is Ed Buckler and Sarah Miller. Um, and yeah, and here's the rest of our lab. So uh, any questions? Awesome. Thanks, Zach. Um, I think uh, Meg just posted a question in the chat. I don't know if you can read that. Yep. So how would you, how would large structural variation between genomes impact the graph, like a one MB inversion with multiple incorporated genes? Um, so they, if it's, if it's alignable, it, it lines up nice and cleanly, right? Um, but if it's, if it's incorporated into like, if it's kind of a tricky alignment where the genes are way out of order and stuff, um, what we end up doing is we, the, the sequence will stay there. It'll just get assigned to a different haplotype. Um, and so, yeah, the, the really large structural variation, it, it's captured in the graph. It might not be, um, is useful with the Kamer read mapping to, to hit those pieces, but, um, some of those filters we might be able to tweak down the road too, just to make it a little more, um, able to handle these things. But ba basically the, the idea is that all the sequence that is in the, the genome is captured somewhere. It might just not be aligned to the right spot. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
And then Tanya also said, have you done a comparison with this pipeline tool with other pan genome assembly pipelines visualization? Um, we haven't really, we, we have tried, when we got started with this uh, uh, variant graph VG had just come out um, and we did actually test that with Maze, um, but we found that it, it did a really poor job at representing um, the genome due to the complexities. Um, we have actually thought to um, also take some of VG and kind of integrate it in our, our current pipeline as well. So like basically we could do VGs at a given reference range so that you would have some of that pangenome SNP level variant um, graph type thing. Um, but we really haven't gotten that far. Um, I think it is kind of on the, the list of things to try out. So, but yeah, we, we really haven't tried any other things as well. Um, what does the output graph look like? Um, so ba basically it is similar to something like this, um, but it's it's stored in a collection of these HVCF files. Um, and actually you can, let me get back to it. There it is. Okay, so this actually can hold more than one sample as well. I only did one for um, simplicity's sake, but you can have, it, it's a VCF file, so you can have more columns here um, for each of your samples um, going in. Uh, what expectations do you have trying to run this for non-plants? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we've, we've been really focused because we are a, a plant genetics lab. Um, I don't know if we've thought about doing this to virus, but yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, with imputation, is it possible to assess uncertainty associated with any given imputed allele when doing GWAS with imputed genomes? We can assume the imputed value is truth or better, incorporate uncertainty. Okay, so that, that's basically saying we, we, we probably could because we could we could score each each reference or each haplotype that was hit. Sorry, Jean Luc, I'm trying to answer your question. Um, so basically, we could we could potentially score each haplotype with a a statistic based on the read mappings potentially, uh -huh. um, and then that could tell you how much support we found for a given imputed haplotype or not. And, and honestly, with the machine learning, that might be even easier because a lot of the time they're giving you a score anyway, and we we make a call one way or another if we want to go that route or not, right? Okay, so so uh, it's possible, but is it in the roadmap, or 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 is it already part? I mean, is there already an option that that sort of says, please report uh, the, the the uncertainty associated with any given imputation? So there's there it's it's not in the pipeline, but we can definitely add it to it, and because um, yeah, I do think that would be helpful, and and maybe that's part of the QC type information that gets spit out as well. Um, so you can say, oh yeah. Especially if you, you ran this and you know, okay, at this given reference range, we just couldn't make a good call for any sample, right? You might want to ignore that from your your downstream analysis as well, right? Um, but yeah, I think having good QCs and that that might be a really good one to um, to integrate first for this this whole pathfinding thing. Cool. Thank you. I can read the next okay. few questions here, Zach. Um, yep. From uh, Brenda, can long read sequencing data be used or just short reads? Uh, for the imputation right now, we're only using short reads. Um, they're, and part part of that is because we, we do have that filter that, uh, or ba basically we, we have a couple of filters That being said, there's nothing stopping us from opening that up so that we hit consecutive reference ranges or stuff like that. So we could potentially hit a long read and use a long read basically to um, to basically help impute this path 
a little bit um, easier. Um, so the answer is not yet, um, but we we've definitely thought about it a little bit. We just haven't gotten to integrating it. Um, from Meg, uh, is version two ready for use by new plants uh, breeding programs now, or should we wait for more development and testing to happen? Um, I think if you're if you're willing to potentially run into bugs and uh, relay them on to us, uh, we'll we would very much appreciate people testing it out on a variety of different things because um, I, I know at least with V one we. We really focused in on maize specifically um, as we were building it. And then when we applied it to something like wheat with the big chromosomes, we realized, oh, wait, our imputation is totally not going to work. So um, we had to revise things that were pretty core to our pipelines. Um, but that, that being said, it, it is it is under active development. We're still working on it right now. It is feature complete with respect to version one. So anything you could have done in version one, you should be able to do in version two. Um, but again, we it, it is under active development. It is it's probably at, at the beta software uh, level at this point. So, um, yeah, it, it's kind of up to you if you want to try it out, and it, it might be a little glitchy and stuff. But yeah, it's there's, there's there should be nothing stopping you from at least trying it. So, um, and, and yeah, and again, if you run into any issues, let us know because we like to smooth those out as quickly as possible. So. And uh, we got one more from uh, Jean-Luc here. Um, as a use case, you mentioned uh, associating metadata with different haplotypes. Do you already have data structures and functionality to store slash work with such metadata? Um, so I think that might be, I'm not sure. So there, there is a fair bit of metadata that goes into the HVCF file um, that's not stored, or I didn't put it in this diagram just because um, I didn't want it to be overwhelming, um, but there is a fair bit of information there. Um, and I think that gets brought into, if you're using RPHG, um, into the data frame correctly. Um, some of the additional types of metadata, so we're, we're even thinking of making this like spit out, as you run a rare allele pipeline, it might spit out a, a list of causal variants. Um, and we we would need to work for, through the data structures um, to get that working. But I, I guess the the thing is, if you try it and you see that there's something missing, um, let us know. And I think Brandon will get it working with R as quickly as he has time. So um, And uh, one, one more for, from Jean-Luc. Um... Uh, what about imputation on the basis of just SNP variants uh, as opposed to short reads? Uh, so, yeah, so that Jean Luc knows because th this is a very, or this is something we had working in V1. Um, I don't see a problem why we can't bring that over um, other than we just haven't done it yet. So, um, so it, basically the idea there was if you have a, you've already aligned something against your reference. Can you use those SNP calls to potentially impute through uh, the graph? And so we, we had something working um, where you could do so in version one. Um, I don't see why we couldn't bring that over. It worked pretty well. So um, yeah, it, I think that's just because we we were really trying to get the basic stuff out. And then um, in the, the camera approach, we were really excited about just because of the speed. So I can add it to the roadmap and see what Ed says. Um, awesome. Uh, oh, it's another comment in there in the chat um, from Anna, uh, Justin. Uh, regarding viruses, I think the assumptions needed uh, for pathfinding through the graph with sexual versus asexual reproduction strategies would be quite different. We haven't tried anything like that yet. Um, it might uh, it might work, but I expect a lot of parameters would have to change first. Yeah, and again, the 
a lot of the commands I showed were the simplified versions. There's still a fair bit of the parameterization. So there, there is the flexibility to change a lot of these parameters. Um, it's just we really thought through what acceptable defaults would be. So there might be ways without even needing to change the code base to, to change some of these parameters without much trouble. Any other questions for Zach? Uh, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, Sean Luke, you want to read your comment out loud? Yeah, I'm just thinking that um, hidden Markov models seem like they're, they're, they're perfectly designed for this, right? Uh, for this biological problem, and so I'm I'm just a little skeptical, I guess. But you know. More power for, to you if you manage to get AI to work, but um, it just seems like HMMs ought to work well for this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And and again, I think this is more. We we we've seen that some of these new deep learning approaches have done some very good things in different other different research questions in our lab, and I, I think we're really thinking through everything we can potentially apply it to. Um, and again, we'll we'll try it. If it works, great. If not, we already have something that works pretty well. So um, it's just effort to test it out. So um, yeah, I don't think the HMM is going anywhere anytime soon. I think it'll still be an option. Cool, thanks. Any other last minute comments, questions? Anything for Zach? Alrighty, cool. Um, All right. Thanks, everybody. And, yeah, with that, uh, thank you, Zach, very much for sharing and and for your whole team for the the work you put into this. Um, and we'll uh, we'll bring this call to a close.